Hi, I'm Melissa. Welcome to the Southern Institute of Technology's academic program, the Certificate in General Horticulture. Well, today I'm here at Thompson's Bush, where we're planning to wage war against the weeds. But more about that later on. Coming up, we take a closer look at fertiliser. And it's go time as I weed out the competition at Thompson's Bush. Move over, Spider-Man. There's some new bugs on the block. They say make hay when the sun shines. But what if that hardly ever happens? Is there more to these giant parcels than meets the eye? It's time to take a look at some winter feed. Brian, what's the difference between baleage and silage? Well, baleage is wrapped in a bale like that, and it's not really um, chopped up at all. Silage is harvested and stacked in bigger heaps, and it's chopped up into smaller, like it's with a 20 mil, and then compacted. Baleage is wrapped as it is off the paddock without being chopped. Right. So what sort of paddock does it come from? Well, anywhere. I mean, it, uh, just an ordinary grass paddock, basically, unless you're making um, cereal. It would come off a um, crop paddock. Right. And how do you manage to roll it up like this? Uh, balers. Yeah, conventional oh, well, roller balers, belt balers or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And sometimes in paddocks you see lots together with sort of tyres on top. That's the stuff. And that's silage? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why do they wrap it up like that? You've got to keep the air out of it because it's like, it's like if you didn't preserve that with the air excluded from it, it would be a big mushy heap of compost. Right. Yeah. And how long does it last for? Forever. Does it? Basically. This will, that won't. Like two years on baleage is pushing it. One, it's probably better to use it than one if you can, but two you can get away with. Right. And is one better than the other? No, just more convenient for a lot of people to, um, a lot more expensive to make baleage. Is it? But it's more convenient for some operators to have baleage because they want to move it around and want to feed it on paddocks and depends what they're doing with it. Right. People who make big volumes generally make fine chop silage, like baleage is sort of only in the hundreds of bales where if you baled some of those stacks that we make you'd have 10,000 bales. Right. Yeah. So which one would you find the most on the average farm? Uh, dairy farmers would be certainly predominantly making fine chop but they do make a lot of bales as well. Oh, very good. Yeah. And so, and what about hay then? Where does hay fit into the equation? Hay is probably a bit more, more difficult to make with weather conditions in Southland. You can't always get good hay so you can always get good baleage, so people make hay when they... When the sun shines. Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you can't get it, well, you wrap it up. Yeah. Very but good. that's hay quite often is made into round bales too without the plastic. I mean, we, we had round bales of hay, but they're all gone, I would have shown you one. Right. So what's the main purpose? Is it for feed? Oh, yeah, all of it's for feed, yeah. yeah. Some, like the, at this time of year, the silage is, and baleage is basically production, uh, maintenance silage. And when they start calving and going into the milking season again, it'll be... Um, the best silage will be getting used for uh, production. Right. And do you feed it to sheep as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is probably not as common on sheep, but yeah, it certainly is. Yeah. And you said this stuff lasts forever. Does it not go off or start as smelling as you, funny? As, you, or? as long as you keep the year out of it, it'll last. It's like a preserving jar, basically. But if the year gets in there, well, it's just a matter of time it breaks down. Right. So this is quite fine, isn't it? Yeah, it's chopped like lawn clippings. That's not chopped at all. And so this is the one that's all big, the big, the big squashed stacks, together? Yeah. The big stack, a clamp they call it. Right. So how long would it take like, to get ready to do all these bales? Uh, well, you should aim to have your paddock shut up for six weeks, 40, 42 days. Then you're making good green grass into, um, into silage or baleage. If you leave it longer it just gets more mature and loses its food value. And right. And is there certain seasons that it's best to do it in? Oh, you only really can only do it in we, we harvest for seven months of the year. We start in October and go right through to, we did work in May this year, which is not that common, but April's quite common. But as long as the grass grows, you can harvest it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the, the tyres that sit on top of that's silage? To, that's to hold the covers down, keep right. it tight, because you've got to exclude, the, 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 the clamps are made tight and rolled tight with big tractors and diggers and stuff, but the plastic is put over to stop the air getting in, and the tyres are there to hold the cover down tight, otherwise it flaps, it sort of pumps the air in and get wastage. Wastage you've got to get rid of, it's just a pain. Right. Fascinating. Who would have thought there's so much to it? <laughs> well, we've been doing it for a few while now. We can't catch it on now. This is, we've done 22 years at it. 
Oh, gee, it's a little, isn't it? It's got a great smell. That is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Brian. Well, thank you. Hi, I'm Greg from Diax, and I'm here to tell you about how to clean up your garden afterwards. So after you've finished harvesting all your crop for the season, the next step to do is to make sure you've cleaned everything properly. It's very important to clean all your gear, sharpen your tools, get all ready for next season. One of the main problems we have down here with our heavy soil in Southland is club root and veggie gardens. And club root and veggie garden can be spread so easily by not cleaning your tools or by using someone else's tools in your own garden. can even be brought along on your feet if you've been walking around. There's so many ways it can be um, caught. So best idea is to keep everything clean. Right, so once you've lifted all your vegetables and potatoes out of the garden, it's good to plant a green crop. Now the green crops for down here are lupin, oats and mustard. Quite simply, just clear the ground sow them lightly and rake them in. Now by doing this you're gonna, it's going to suppress weed growth through the winter and also when it comes towards springtime when they're about just under knee height dig it all in and let it sit for a, a month or so before you want to use the soil and that helps build up humus and adds nitrogen to your soil which is beneficial for all your leaf crops. If you're not going to be sowing, sowing a green crop like of the mustard or lupin it's good to lay the ground with peace straw, and that will help. That will help build up the humus and add the nitrogen as well, and suppress the weed growth. In your tunnel house or glass house, you can do the same, or a good cleaning up with basimid. It will sterilise the soil, and as far as the bugs and everything go in your tunnel house, you could even let off a bug bomb. So, cleaning up is the main key. So, um, and I hope everyone gets in and does it does a good old clean up before they start their new season's growth. So good luck and good gardening. People often use Barocca coffee and energy drinks to give them a buzz and to help them look their best in the mornings. But how do we get our plants to look their best? Maybe Stephen can help us with this one. Some of the most common fertilisers used in agriculture in New Zealand would primarily be superphosphate, which is a phosphate source and a sulphur source. Um, we also use a lot of potassium chloride, particularly on certain times of, types of farms like dairy or in arable situations and quite often in, in horticultural situations as well. So that's a potassium source. Nitrogen is quite a commonly used fertiliser, more as a growth promotant for growing pasture and growing crops than actually as a maintenance fertiliser for the soil. Superphosphate is actually manufactured, so what happens is we, we bring a phosphate source or a phosphate rock um, that comes from offshore into the country and it is mixed with a sulfuric acid to, to um, to make superphosphate. Um, potassium chloride is imported from overseas, uh, as is a lot of nitrogen fertilisers that are brought into the country. A lot of our compound fertilisers like DAP, which is a phosphate nitrogen mix, or nitrophosca, which is a, has, um, is a high analysis fertiliser and it has nitrogen, phosphate, potassium and sulphur all mixed in one fertiliser, they're all brought in from overseas as well. Phosphate, potassium and sulphur tend to be applied in the summer and the early autumn. Um, potassium normally on dairy farms in November, December, January and P or phosphate and sulphur potentially on dairy farms at the same time of the year and sheep farms in January, February, March. Reason being winter and especially in Southland, when we're cold, soil temperatures are low, soil moisture levels are quite high. We don't tend to grow a lot of pasture anyway and we can get quite a few losses over that period of time due to the moisture and to the low soil temperatures. In a situation where 
people don't fertilise, and there's a number of reasons for that, be it monetary or just perhaps because they, they don't understand why they need to fertilise it. There's some quite significant, there will be some quite significant reductions in, in yield, being pasture growth or, or whatever you're trying to grow. Um, so it's, it's quite important that the, the right amount of fertiliser is applied, the right type of fertiliser is applied. Um, now, to be able to work out what those products are, um, this is where we come in as, as field officers in regards to doing soil testing, um, doing herbage testing, and also at times, um, if it's in a pastoral situation, doing um, uh, testing, testing blood and testing livers of livestock will also give us an indicator of what is being uptaken by the stock from, from the soil and from the pasture. Deep down in the bush, we meet up with Richard Bowman, who's moving full steam ahead with the team from Weedbusters. So what you do is first of all you select your plant, find the base of it, which is, you can see this is a, this is a barberry here, quite a spindly looking thing. Yeah, okay. Cut it off quite close to the base. And you just remember where that... Basically you want to be straight on it. Straight on it, really. And that stops yeah. it growing back. It stops it growing yeah. back. And see that bright blue colour? Yeah. That's um, a dye that we use in it, so it's easy to see where you've put it on if it was clear you wouldn't necessarily see right. it, but that nice bright blue colour. So what is this we're putting on them? It's this called Vigilant. Vigilant. It's a special herbicide which is um, designed especially for this sort of work. It actually contains the active ingredient the same as, as you get in Tordon for gorse. Oh right. Brand. So the pieces that we're cutting out, do we actually have to remove them now? Um, well, it doesn't really matter. They'll, 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 providing they don't get back on the ground again and they can't re sprout off the ground, sometimes they will lay off the ground. Yeah, um, you can just leave them in the bush. Alternatively, we can just drag them out into the clearing. Right. And um, then the city and the, the reserves it. people come and take them away. This looks like a another Darwin's Barbary here. You can see a little healthy specimen. Only a single. A single trunk. What did you say it was called? Darwin's Barbary. Right. It's, it's from South America. It does very well in New Zealand. You can see how it's become, it's just fighting against the southern native undergrowth here. Yep. And eventually um, they can become quite dominant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get down that. Looks like it's got quite a long and complicated stem, this one. You can see it's not just a simple um, thing growing out of the ground, it looks like it, it runs along the ground right a wee way. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and, try and get it. Like what I might even do, I might need change hand. tools. Do most of these weeds just occur in native bush? Um, they certainly do well in native bush. Normally you'd think that they would need more light, but these ones are adapted to work in quite low light environments. And they compete very effectively with our native undergrowth species. Right. Now I can feel that starting to actually root on the ground, but I think I've got it all there. The next, the key point now is to get some of this stuff, find where it came from. You're right there with your vagina. Yeah, I am. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. So many of these weeds would you find in the average backyard? Yeah, well, a lot of people thought they made quite attractive ornamental plants. And they planted them in their gardens. Like you, a lot of them you could buy from nurseries once upon a time. Most of them are banned now. Right. And of course, they do quite well in people's gardens. But then these plants jump over the fence, and they start living in places that you don't want them to. And before long, they become weeds, and they um, they start to take over. Mm. So what we'll do is we'll take this piece, cool. take it out to the edge. Because you're saying this one's from South America. How did yeah. it originally? Get here. Well, it would have been bought by people who thought it might have made quite an attractive hedge plant or an ornamental plant. I mean, people are great collectors. Yeah. And they love bringing in new stuff. And that was the way it was in the old days. Unfortunately, like a lot of things like rabbits and rats and mice and deer, we find they do a lot of things we don't want them to do once they get here.
figured out. So the main person you've got to get rid of them is because they sort of strangle all the native trees. Yeah, they become dominant and they displace our own native vegetation. Mm. And you can see in some places, like holly for example, can just about take over a whole area after a while because it's more vigorous, it competes, it out-competes our native plants. And um, then we don't have native forest anymore. Mm. So this is a problem that's everywhere, not just necessarily Thompson's Bush. It's very common in many parts of New Zealand, particularly near cities, because people have lots of these plants in their gardens. Birds go into their gardens, eat the fruit, come out to the next native patch of bush, and they spread seeds into the native patch of bush. Well, hopefully the natives will, 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 will pick up, they'll fill up the spaces that those weeds came out of, and it'll be harder for those weeds to get back into it again. One thing that really made it good for weeds was when we had the big, uh, the big snow and frost here in 1996. And what happened was it actually, it damaged a lot of the canopy and a lot of the branches um, died and let a lot more light in. And that actually encouraged a lot of these weeds to grow because it gave them the extra light they needed to kickstart them. Now that the canopy is recovering, um, it means it's not such a good place for these, these plants. They don't do quite so well. So if we help the natives to, to recover and to, um, to compete against the weeds, then hopefully the, the natives will stay dominant. Which is what we want. Now it's a climber. Oh, okay. And what happens? This thing will completely cover over this tree trunk if it's allowed to. Oh, so really? I'm going to, Let's have a look at this I'm going to give it a good. Unfortunately, there are so many little strands of it, and it, it runs along the ground. But we've probably stopped it from climbing that tree trunk now. But if it was allowed to, it would just grow a complete a whole So this, all this is yeah, yeah, ivy, so we just need to pull this no, up off. not all of it's ivy, there's actually a native fern here, there's a, there's oh, a difference. Right. There's two, you two different natives. See, so this is the one that we don't want, see how it's, how it's clinging to the tree? This is the one we don't want. Okay. This one, the one we don't want, yeah. See how it's, it's gone right up to there? Oh yeah. And now I'm pulling off, we try and, we won't disturb the, um, the native fern here. And... I found some more barbary, so if I grab that. So these wee bits here, it's still... Yeah, pull, pull them all off because what happens is they actually, um, they actually, they almost like grow roots into the trunk. They actually take mm. their sustenance from the, the tree itself and so you can actually pull the roots off and they can still survive on the tree trunk. It's, this is really nasty stuff, ivy. Oh. Once it gets in there, it's very hard to deal with. I don't think we've got the answer for ivy, unfortunately, apart from a lot of really hard work pulling it out. And um, we're always going to leave some behind. And it's going to grow back again. Is this, and this, is this ivy, these ones? Uh, yeah, that's ivy too. Yeah, that's, that's right. So that's ivy there. So we've, got, we've slowed it down, but I don't think we've stopped it. See how I keep pulling it up the floor of the bush here? And I think this stuff we probably should carry out with us because if we leave it lying on the floor of the bush, it could just find its way back into the soil. Okay. So here's the, here's the vigilant. So if I cut, you can paste. Yes. And we've got two with one hat. So those two there need to be done. And Great. we may as well drag those out. Fantastic. Well, I'll leave this with you, Richard. That's good. And that's ready to go out. Fantastic. Right. Thank you, it's been fun. Good one. Oh, thanks for your help. <laughs> we need more people like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, hello again, it's uh, Lindsay here. Um, here we're making the fertiliser for our fruit trees. And the normal course of events is fish, more than that obviously. And we use kelp in there, preferably a little bit more fermented than that. Uh, we add a little bit of lawn cuttings on top there, which stops the smell. And we definitely don't recommend you put this under your neighbor's window. You, you'll definitely fall out with them. But it is, a, it is a, oh, and probably a bit of potassium sulfate for fruit trees. And in some cases we've added magnesium sulfate it will be the total diet for a fruit tree. Um, we do use this out on, on uh, the small crops as well. Uh, it's an excellent, an excellent fertiliser. Um, we then put a cover crop out 
uh, probably a nitrogen fixing crop like broom is a good example there'll be nodules on the roots where where the nitrogen's fixed but we don't recommend that you plant broom as a, as a cover crop or gorse gorse will fix nitrogen so uh, we use a, a range of crops out there that are nitrogen fixes so we even do clover at times um, fruit uh, commercially when you take your fruit off the trees they're they're put into controlled refrigeration controlled atmosphere, you might have uh, CO2 or ethylene dibromide if I'm rightly. Um, in some cases the fruit is waxed. Uh, sometimes you pick it early, which doesn't, like tomatoes for an example in Australia, we, we had 20,000 tomato plants and they were gassed in um, shipping containers with ethylene dibromide to, to ripen up. That's post-harvest. Um, Yes, when you're, when you're uh, growing things, this is an immense subject, you're always learning. And the Chinese say, if you spent your life growing things, you've had a good life. And I totally recommend it, folks. You've heard it said, it's the little things in life that matter. But when it comes to critters, are they friend or foe? It's time for us to go and bug Eric. Eric, what bugs are beneficial for the garden? Oh, many, many things are great. A fantastic bee garden. It's amazing, amazing what is hiding away at the bottom of your garden or in the soil or in the litter, in the, in the dead material that's around the base of your plants. Those things are great because if you want, if you want your soil to, be, to continue to be renewed and to continue to be great for your plants and, and for the rain to sink in rather than sit, sit on top, you need those insects and you need those worms. It's been, have, there's lots of things which are great. So how can we tell what are the good bugs and what are the bad bugs? It's a, good, it's a tough question because there are so many and they do so many things and they do it so secretly. You know, you get out in the morning and look at your garden and there's the holes in the leaves. What did that? You know, um, if they did it during the day, the birds would be straight in there and snip them up, you know. So birds would be great for getting rid of those things, except that they work at night sometimes, those things. Or they, or they camouflage, they look the same as the leaf. Very tough. Yeah, so what are the ones that put holes in the leaves? Well, actually, it's lots of things. I mean, there are insects that do it, obviously, caterpillars for, of moths and caterpillars of butterflies. You know, the cabbage white butterfly is renowned as, as, a, as one of the bad guys, I guess. Oh, really? But, um, but you know, slugs do it too. And, and they're not even insects, they're a completely different kind of organism. The thing that kills, you know, the pest, uh, if you know it's a slug, you need a certain kind of, of um, you know, poison that you'd use for that. It won't work on insects. They're different to insects. Right. Yeah. But how do you get on with poisons if you spray and use fertiliser? Will it kill the good bugs as well? Um, it can do, yes, that's right. If you use an insecticide, it will, it's often it will kill all insects, whatever the insect is, and the good insects and the bad ones. You know, we've got insects that are vicious predators, you know, if you, if you don't want to be, if they were the same size as us, you'd be running. But those, those things, are, you know, they like um, uh, ladybird, uh, ladybird larvae and ladybird adult beetles, and they're like um, lace wings, and they're like uh, a range of, uh, of predatory flies and, and beetles and so on. Yeah, there's lots of good things out there as well. So um, why are they so good mm. for the garden? Well, I, I guess it's, it's um, uh, they make your garden into, into an ecosystem, you know. So, so uh, you know, it's great. It, I think you've got a healthy backyard when you've got a bit of everything. You've got a bit of bird life, and a, but, but, you know, but as well as the bird life, you've got a, a range, of, range of neat flowers, a range of neat, you know, you've got your grasses and, 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 and you've got leaf litter under trees and shrubs. You know, you have a bit of an ecology, and so, and so when you've got that, it's matched by a whole range of insects, a whole range of worms, a whole range of <coughs> slugs, a whole range of, of um, all sorts of, of invertebrate life, you know, slaters and so on. They're all good things. So what can we do to encourage all this good mm. life in the garden? Yeah. Well, I guess it's like I was just describing, you know, have a range of plants and, and, um, and, you know, and use your compost well and, 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 uh, um, and think about uh, uh, shelter in some parts of your garden and not in other parts of your garden, or, you know, a good light environment. All those things, you know, if you have a good light environment, you'll, you'll foster the things that love basking in the sun, you know. And so even in, in this part of the world, we have grasshoppers and we have butterflies, of course, you know, it's great. Yeah. So tell us about beautiful butterflies. Are they not so good for the garden? Um, they, might, they might not be if they're cabbage white butterflies, for example. But, uh, but, you know, what's wrong with one or two? How can you spot a cabbage white butterfly? Um, 
I think uh, one of the things about New Zealand is that we don't have a huge butterfly fauna like many other parts of the world. So if you see a, if you see a white butterfly going past, it can only be that actually. Really? Yeah. We don't have many, many, many species. It's, it's introduced to New Zealand. We have no native ones that look the same. Our native butterflies are fantastic as well, but they're different to that. Right. You've got some butterflies yeah. in here, haven't you? I have. Can you crack them open? Here we go. <laughs> so I've got a few pests and, and a few and a few neat things as well. There we go. Oh, cool. So. Maybe we'll hold it that way so yeah. the view can look better. So are these good butterflies? Um, I don't know, if, if, you, if you like having tui and bellbird, if you think those things are great, then I think you would appreciate these as well. It's amazing, isn't it, the yeah. detail on the wings when you mm. see them like that. And what about these fellas here, who are they? Um, these are fantastic natives as well. I mean, uh, I guess um, uh, uh, I love them. They live in wetlands, they live in alpine herb fields and grasslands, but unfortunately they also live in paddocks and in your own back, uh, back, backyard in the grasses. And so these, so if you see grasses that are suddenly um, becoming very thin at this time of the year, it's probably the caterpillars of Parina moth. Right. Yeah. These are these are the other guys that might be doing the same job as these um, chafer beetles and the chafer beetle larvae, um, you know, grass scrub. Grass scrub can be doing the same thing. So grass scrub and Parina moths, I guess a couple of the bad guys and, and you start to really see it this time of the year. I've got a few other insects here too, some plant sucking bugs, I guess. There's, um, you know, plants have, are attacked by all sorts of things and so uh, here's a range of, of, of the sort of things that can um, get stuck in and suck plants. Some of them, and they're all, they're all bad guys, I guess they're like aphids, larger versions of aphids. That's fascinating. Um, Eric, you're a wealth of knowledge, <laughs> thank you very much. No problem. <laughs>well that's it from us for this series we have had a lot of fun so before we go let's take a look at some of the things we've learnt over the past few weeks what are the main purposes of and usage of flax it originally caught off for open twine because that was you know the bailers and sealers needed it in that day and captain cook of course that's why he liked new zealand too when Tore down and found it, and, and they needed it in those days because rope didn't last very long. So this big machine here, it's pulling the bulbs out, is it? Out yeah, ground? it's got um, it's lifting them, lifting them straight up, and it's got a series of belts so that it has shakers on it to sort of try and shake some of the soil off. Oh, come on, pull! A bit of a neck to it. <sighs> Look at that. It's a good size swede. Yeah, if I had a pocket knife, I'd just all that off for you. <laughs> so of course they're looking very bare at the moment. When would they have the next sort of grapes on them? Well this uh, bud burst will happen in spring, around October, November, and then flowering will happen in December, and the fruit set will come on in February, which is when the, they'll actually start to ripen, the colours will change, and hopefully harvest, as long as the weather keeps keeps doing its good stuff, will be April. Because you were saying this one's from South America, how did yeah. it originally get here? Well it would have been brought by people who thought it might have made quite an attractive head plant or an ornamental plant. I mean people are great collectors yeah, and they love bringing in new stuff and that was the way it was in the old days. Unfortunately, like a lot of things oh. like rabbits and rats and mice and deer, we find they do a lot of things we don't want them to do once they get here. Thank you for joining us for the Southern Institute of Technology's academic program, the Certificate in General Horticulture. If you'd like more information about this course, you can contact the team at SIT on 0800 SIT to learn. Bye for now. <laughs>